what storytelling is fundamentally is knowledge wrapped up in such a way for maximum viral transmission. Hello, intelligent beings of this marvelous planet. Welcome to the 42 Courses podcast and thanks for listening. John York is the author of Into the Woods, the biggest selling screenwriting book in the UK for the last six years. John is a double BAFTA winner as program maker and multi BAFTA winner as commissioner. In his TV career, he's worked as both the head of Channel 4 drama and controller of BBC drama production. And he's been involved in such massive hits as Wolf Hall, Life on Mars, The Street, Shameless, Bodies and EastEnders. Now he works worldwide as a drama producer, consultant and lecturer on all forms of storytelling. So I'm really excited to speak today to John York. Hi, John. Hi, Brent. Pleasure to be here. Thank you so much for your time. Nice. I love talking about this stuff, so I'd be delighted. Yeah, so Into the Woods, absolutely, you know, massively famous storytelling book. Can you give people who may have not read it a quick overview? Uh, Oh, gosh. Uh, Yeah, the simple overview is 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 when I I started doing it, I I I started doing it because I thought there was a gap in the market because there were a thousand books on screenwriting. I mean, literally ridiculous amounts of screenwriting. And they all told you what you should do, but none of them told you why. Mm. And because I'd had, it sounds really embarrassing, but I had, because I had a a very good university training that sort of taught me in rigorous thinking you know, I could hear my tutor in my head going, that's that's not acceptable. This is not acceptable for you to tell me there's an, there has to be an inciting incident on page 24 without telling me why. Uh-huh. Uh, and and everywhere I read, I couldn't find the answer. You know, it's not in Robert McKee, it's not in Sidfield, it's not in Christopher Vogler. Uh, there are some places like Lagos Egri and some David Mamet stuff where, you know, they, they, they're very helpful. I'm not dismissing the other books out of hand, but 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 it was it was that that led me on to go. I need to work out why why stories have the shape they do, and that was the thing that really drove it. And and yeah, we were just mentioning just before we started that you're incredibly well read because every sentence in the book is you know referring to some uh, classic text almost. <laughs> and so, how did you learn about narrative structure? Was it you, you just analysing all of these classics? Well, it's very, it's that, yeah, so it's, it, it's slightly self-indulgent, really, isn't it? Like, you know, like it's a substitute for engaging with real people in the real world, I often think, stories. Um, I, I mean, I, yeah, I was fortunate I came from a very well-read family and I was surrounded by books growing up. And then I did English at university, which is all you do is read. And then I worked in television drama and most of that is reading. So, so there's a big part of that. Um, but the, the this book came about when I was... Uh, working for BBC, I'd, I'd I started the BBC, I'd gone to Channel Four, and I'd come back again. Uh, and and I, one of my jobs was running continuing drama, so I was doing independent drama, but I was also doing the old war British war horse shows like EastEnders and Casualty. And I came back and I looked at them, and I was really alarmed at the s- storytelling. You know, it, it, it felt like um, you know, it wasn't, you know, it, it didn't really know what it was doing. And, and then I suddenly realized, well, I don't really know what I'm doing either. So I better find out. And then I set up a training course and I decided that the best person to teach that would be me selfishly, because then I would learn as well. And I started off by, you know, fairly blatantly plagiarizing the standard texts of the day, like Robert McKean's mm-hmm. story, going back to Sid Field and Vogler. Um, but I was in a very fortunate position was that I was also making about 500 hours of television a year at wow. that point. So I could test it. Mm. And, 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 and so that was, that was the big thing is that as I tested it, I start to realize what worked and what didn't. And very slowly over two or three years, um, I started to, go oh i get it i it must be this and that and unfortunately the job allowed me to then interrogate you know i found myself you know going in all kinds of mad journeys you know i mean way back to you know aristotle and then forward but all the way through you know 16th 17th 18th century you know it was an amazing journey and i just i just loved it you know there, there's a my favorite bit in the whole book still it's it's an old book now but in the in the in the notes at the back is i do the history of the inciting incident 
<laughs> like, uh, and I and, and lo I love that. There was so much research, and it was I was like depressed that it ended up as a footnote. But but you know <laughs> that's the stuff I really geek out on, which you know, probably explains why why I got married very late in life. <laughs> but that that raises an interesting point. I mean, it, working and writing a book at the same time. Like I've in interviewed a few authors on this podcast, and. Some of them, everyone does it a different way, but your friend, Simon Lancaster, he he said he read 250 books. I think you've probably beaten that if you, in the process now for this. Uh, probably, but it's a lifetime. You know, it's like, you know, they say like with, with you know, a band's first album is the lifetime that's built up to it. The, you know, the difficult second album is the six yeah. months with someone shouting, where's my next record? You know, so, so, so if there is a second book and, you know, there is a plan for a second book, uh, you know, it's it, that's much harder because I've used up, you know, all my knowledge. I mean, a lot of references in the book were, you know, it's things I dis I came across as a child. You know, uh, you know, the books I read as a child and, uh -huh. and the knowledge I gained then, really. But but returning to the process, were you writing before and after work? I mean, how did you fit it all in? Well, because I was teaching uh, at work the knowledge I needed to write the book I gained from doing that you know you, uh -huh. you'd stress test every idea and you'd see you teach students it you see how the students reacted to it how they came back to it so in a sense the hard work was was doing the knowledge working out you know why stories are the shape they are you know I was in the perfect laboratory you know so it was all work and and writing at the same time really and then what I did is I would I, I, I'd just set the alarm early and i'd get up at quarter to five and i'd write for uh -huh. a couple of hours and then yeah you know, i didn't have a child then so so then i'd i'd, I'd work in the evening till about eight o'clock and then i'd do most weekends uh -huh. um you know but it was weird because the, the you know the, it, it took six years to write but four years wow. of that were really hanging around you know and, and it was only when i you know like the last couple of years where i started to go oh i know what this is because it couldn't work out what it was and once i knew what it was then it was pretty quick after that. That's interesting about the discovery of, of what it was. And, and, and at what point did you approach a publisher and say, this is what it is? Uh, well, do you know, I mean, I, you know, th th this story makes people hate me and quite rightly too. It's like, cause it's very unfair, but, but what happened was it was, it was ridiculously simple. It is, uh, is one of my students when I was at the BBC was a former publishing uh, editor at Penguin. Mm. And he he said to me when I was teaching, he said, you should turn this into a book. And I was like, he said, no, go on. And so after much persuasion, because I couldn't quite see it, uh, I wrote a first chapter. I mean, it took a long time to write a first chapter because getting, finding your voice, finding what the tone is, and also working out that this, this can't be a, a, a how-to book because there's thousands of them. Yeah. You know, and working out the tone of voice is you want it to be rigorously intellectual, but you don't want to alienate anyone. Yeah. yeah. You know, those things took ages. But in the end, after like three years later, I presented him with a chapter. Uh uh, and I met up with him and to give to and he gave me some notes and they were lo lovely notes and they were very basic. And I said, What are you doing? He said, Well, well, hang on, he said, because I've you know, you, you don't have to do anything because I've I've already sent it to Penguin. Right. Uh, and because he was who he was, he was Jamie Oliver's old editor, like first uh -huh. editor. Uh, and Penguin that literally rang me up two weeks later and said, come in. And I Brilliant. came in, they said, we'd, we'd like to buy your book. So, so it was it was lovely and ridiculously unfair. It's who you know. So Thank you why you can get it. Good stuff. Yeah. 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 I mean, so, so, so you know, I, I didn't really have to do anything at all. I then had to write it, obviously, but. Well, I'm very glad to hear that you were teaching because 42 courses is all about teaching and learning. And um, right. on, on the storytelling course, like Into the Woods is, of course, you know, as a go to, it's on the recommended reading list. And oh, there's one fantastic. there's one sentence that really shouted at me, actually, it was like, there can be no doubt that storytelling is at some level about learning. Do you want yes. to expand on that? Yeah. Yeah, and in fact, I, you know, I'd go even further now. It is all about learning. It's, <laughs> it's, um, I, you know, like, I mean, it's a, it's a cliche in screenwriting terms. Is what does your protagonist learn? Mm -hmm. But that is the shape of all fundamentally archetypal stories. A character has a flaw; they learn to overcome that flaw. And the reason that's the archetypal shape, I think, because it embodies a lesson 
you want to pass on. Mm-hmm. So, so, so in a sense that, you know, what storytelling is fundamentally is knowledge uh, wrapped up in such a way for maximum viral transmission. You know, nice. it's like, you know, if, if you go back to its earliest things, you know, you tell stories to, to protect the tribe, and to give the tribe meaning in a, in a, in a, in a, in a, in a, in a fundamentally unfriendly world. Uh, and then, you yeah, know, what story, the, rap, the story does, the fact that it makes you emotionally identify, weaponizes that knowledge. So it, so it, it overcomes all other things and embeds itself within, I mean, within your tribe fundamentally. Mm-hmm. You know, so I, I think, you know, it, it's, 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 if you want to pass on knowledge successfully, you do it in the form of story. So uh, if we disregard for a moment, like the underlying structural traits of the three act or the five act structure, mm. the formula for great story is the lesson to be learned. Is that the? Yeah, yeah, I, it's absolutely that. But, you know, again, three act structure is the perfect illustration of that. You know, a character exists. They have a problem. They're thrown down a rabbit hole. You know, and they have to work their way out of the rabbit hole and they work their way out of the rabbit hole by learning the thing they need to learn to overcome their initial problem, which they then do in the last act in the archetype. And um, there was something a few years ago, uh, I think it was the University of Washington and then University of Vermont. I saw a BBC article about it and it was saying that that they'd done a sentiment analysis of all Western literature using AI and they were saying that there's only six um, story uh, types. There's the rags yeah. to riches, riches to rags, Icarus. And do you, do you agree with that, or is it all about? Well, the you story? know, it's really interesting because because I, I I mean yeah, there there it is a trope, isn't it? I mean, I think when I started, yeah, it was there. There are only seven stories, uh, and then I was trying, you know, and, and and a student asked me this. This was long before I did the book or the teaching, and I was trying to work out what they were. I could never quite articulate it and even then there was um christopher booker's uh massive magnum opus on storytelling um whose name i forget for a second it'll come back to me there's the seven basic plots of course it is the seven basic plots and i mean it's an amazing book it's mad because you know christopher booker was clearly mad and you know, like, if you think I've read a lot, his learning was just mind-bogglingly off the scale. Uh, and, you know, he comes to, he, he has this extraordinary knowledge and he comes to ridiculous conclusions. This is, you know, storytelling is all based on Jung, but he doesn't, there's no proof. It's just the patterns fit Jung, but that's not proof. Um, and he articulates the seven basic plots and rags to riches is one of them. Uh, I can't remember the others offhand, um, but two there's, of them. Are, there's a Cinderella as well, which is yeah. Paul Rice, no, Cinderella. Paul Rice, yeah. Paul, is it? Is that the one? Yeah. Yeah, I, yeah, I think so. Uh, uh, I'll look it up if you want. Uh, and um, uh, but then he says he one of the plots is comedy, and that you know, you know anyone can answer. Like, that's not a plot. Mm. You know, that's a genre. Mm-hmm. And, 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 and so it, it sort of breaks down. Now, I think there probably are, you know, a small tapestry of stories, but even there, they all overlap, you know, because Cinderella is a rags to riches story. It is a triumph over adversity story. You know, it is a story where a character learns. It's, you know, it's all of those. They all overlap. Well, Cinderella and its dark inversion. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, Cinderella is Harry Potter and is Star Wars. I mean, they're all the same. Yeah. Yeah. story silas mana whatever so i think i think probably i would argue there's there's really two stories there's one story and then the second story is that story turned on its head <laughs> but i just made that up so like, that's the second book <laughs> right it's coming yeah so that's, yeah I'll, I'll send that to penguin afterwards see how they react to that one. <laughs> um another really uh great fantastic sentence a story is like a magnet dragged through randomness <laughs> Do you think I think that's actually probably a touch pretentious? Um, <laughs> but yeah, yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I was trying to come up with an image that that was striking enough to say, you know, the, the world is random and chaotic and and terrifying because of that. And what stories make the world safe. So you mm. take all these things and you pull them into an order that makes the world go, 
ah, but I get it now, that's okay. And some of that order is based on rational observation, but you know, it's just as equal to say, you know, I mean, religion is the perfect story. You know, it's, it's like, it's a story that defines you as a person. It's not particularly rational, mm. um, but it is a magnet drag through the iron filings of randomness, you know, <laughs> pulling them into a straight line that make, your know, stories make the world safe. Mm. Even if they're scaring you, they sort of make the world safe. They make the world coherent, because otherwise um, it's just a terrifying super yeah. randomness. Understanding through learning, yeah. Um, yeah, you know, funny enough, like, I did get in Sue's corner in private eye, if that means anything to your listeners, with the book, because I, cause I said there's a bit about the crisis point in the book where, where I talk about, where it, I, I ref, refer to the Muppet movie, Mm -hmm. uh and, and literally at the crisis point in the, the muppet movie the remake muppet movie you know they, they say to the central character like are you a man or a muppet and and he has to choose <laughs> in some way we are all that central character <laughs> faced with exactly the same <laughs> dilemma uh and i quite rightly just ended up in, in, in suit's corner for that one um now storytelling is uh i i did a few years in corporate and it's everyone's talking about storytelling and, and marketing and everything it's all, all everything is storytelling these days um the, the the type of structures that you analyze in in the book um do you think they can be mapped onto like the most boring business presentation uh, is it a thing they should be uh <laughs> because i think all presentations you know if you've got to get points because you tell us you should be telling a story and the best presentations are just narrative in powerpoint or oral form but it is it's it so you know if you want to if you want to communicate your knowledge to another person effectively you have to tell it as a story because because it, it then it works emotionally and mm -hmm. that's what you remember you, the stories work they don't work rationally they work emotionally but i mean i've sat through all those business presentations i mean you know over years of going to various conferences and it's quite weird because a lot of people don't i mean some people are brilliant at it and very good but a lot of people don't you know and i remember talking to some people saying what you why you're giving the answer away at the beginning that you've got to save the answer till the end and they're going mm -hmm. oh no no we're always told to give the answer at the beginning so otherwise people will get bored and you know like and and i you know i mean my to which my answer is no like you tease the answer you tell them you have the mm. answer uh and you build up why that answer is so important and how it will change your life if you know it but you don't tell it till the last 10 pages yeah. otherwise they've got no reason to keep watching or listening and it's exactly the same with every presentation you know what's the big reveal well hot yeah you ask all stories are question and answer you know so really you know you start at the beginning you pose a, a question then you drum into people why the answer to this question is so important and so life-changing and then you tease it and tease it and tease it until the very end and you give it away yeah actually so, yeah. If, you, if, you, if you go back to um 2007 steve jobs doing that iphone presentation that's that's got the narrative right there hasn't it yeah he was brilliant mm. yeah i mean oh my god yeah i mean he was a master of narrative and he was the perfect protagonist oh, yeah um actually Pretty talking of protagonists um what uh as a writer do you think is more uh enjoyable to create is it the protagonist or the antagonist oh well that's a good question uh the antagonist i imagine i mean i mean the antagonist is the most important element i think i'm coming to this conclusion that actually it's all about the enemy mm. you know and i think what led me to that conclusion was actually watching joe biden's campaign you know which was really fascinating because effectively he didn't do anything really <laughs> you know he just sort of sat in a bunker for yeah. a year and didn't scare anyone mm. You know, and he was, you know, it was like, I am safe, I am sound, I drive a car, I'm just like you, you know, and I appeal to blue collar and white collar. Uh, but nothing really controversial. But the Trump was so powerful as an enemy by then, particularly when COVID came along, that it would that was enough to give him the narrative to defeat Trump. You know, so and I, so I think you know that that to me is like you know every great story is defined by its antagonist or its forces of antagonism, and if you get that right, 
then the story shape emerges naturally around it. You know, you, we need to hate the enemy or understand why it's so important to beat the enemy. And that works in story, that works in Jaws and Beowulf, obviously, but it also works, you know, if you look at the, the Elizabeth Holmes story, the Theranos mm. story, the enemy is people dying too young. And of okay. course you want to defeat that. Of course you want to defeat it. You want to defeat it more than anything in the world. And that's what made, I mean, that coupled with her extraordinary personality, you know, made her the youngest billionaire in Silicon Valley. You know, it was obviously based on nothing in the mm. end. But, you know, that's a, it's a, good, a really good example of it, I think. Um, I was just thinking when you were talking about the antagonist, because uh, I, I wanted to talk to you about um, some recent uh massive hits like you know Bre breaking bad downton abbey mm -hmm. stranger things and that. but then i suddenly thought of friends yeah <laughs> what is there an is there an antagonist in friends uh, well it's it's yeah i mean friends is is whether you like it or not you can't not but acknowledge it is the singular most successful narrative product that has been produced in the last 50 years. It is mind-bogglingly successful and mind-bogglingly brilliant. I think um, there's an enemy in every, every week. There's a problem every week that threatens the coherence of the gang. So there isn't one big, because it's, it's fundamentally serious shaped story of the week, the one where. Mm -hmm. So, so you're in every episode, there's a problem, but you're desperate for our, protagonists to overcome that week the bigger design which i think is, is was it's kind of brilliant was 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 all in that simple log line they sold it with which is your friends are your family now and oh. you know what's so clear is that looking back at it now is you know, one level the antagonists are the, the parents the family it's everyone around them are the threat oh. to their family uh -huh. All their parents are so utterly useless and dysfunctional and crazy, you know, that, that in some level they are the antagonist that binds the gang together. The gang have had to make a new family out of their friends because the fam families that existed in the Waltons and before that, the Andy Griffiths show, you know, doesn't exist anymore, uh -huh. you know. So I think it's that, that combination. I mean, not everything's a monster film, is what I'm trying to say, but as long as you care enough to, to wish the antagonist dead, you know, metaphorically, yeah. then the story will work. And what happens when you don't follow the rules of narrative structure? Do we, do uh, we, not, do we not have examples because they're not successful enough and we don't know these oh, stories? No, yeah, no, I, I mean, there's plenty that, I mean, yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, I spend a lot of time watching obscure art house movies partly to ask that question but also because i really like them you know in fact i grew up on them far you know i mean mainstream narrative came to me very late i was much more interested in you know the films of jean-luc godard when i was uh, young uh you know because my father made me watch them um and the, the answer is, yeah, there's loads of films that don't follow archetypal narrative and use everything from Michael Haneke to last year in Marion Bad to, uh, you know, Tarkovsky. I mean, the list is endless, really. Um, and, yeah, the, what I think is fascinating about those, 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 um, all those stories is they, it's not that they don't have the archetype with, within them, because they do, but what they do is it's like, um, it's like jazz or it's like, um, mm -hmm. you know, modern music is, you know, you expect music to resolve. And that's what happens in a Disney film or a Marvel film. It resolves as you would expect it to. Mm -hmm. But in a Michael Haneke film, you know, there's a murder. You expect the murderer to be caught, but they're not. And that's really odd. And it's disconcerting. It, you're playing against the melody. You know, you're going to a seventh or a sixth or a mi you're, you're coming back with a minor key that's atonal. And that, of course, that works. It works brilliantly because it feels uncomfortable and it gives you the feeling the filmmaker wants you to have. It will never, ever be as commercially successful as something that resolves into the major key again. Uh -huh. It just won't because more people want stories to make them happy all the time but it's it's still there and you know there's more and more extreme versions of it but even in um uh andre rublev you know the tarkovsky film where there's you know, the protagonist isn't in it for two-thirds of the film 
you know you can you you realize that actually the protagonist is is the theme which is the creation destruction and then recreation of art once okay. again so you find its shape in there in all kinds of interesting ways but chopped up by mad people to create you know interesting narrative dissonance which is really exciting it, do, do you think that dissonance is there in uh what's it called three billboards outside ebbing missouri francis mcdormand and sam rockwell because uh, they don't yeah. the practice doesn't really achieve achieve their aim and get the resolution that they're searching for no but they get a different resolution don't they a new relationship. Uh, I mean, like, this is like, I, you should have asked me to watch it before we did the call because I haven't seen it for, since it came out. Oh, I, mean, I really oh, okay. enjoyed yeah, it. I really enjoyed it. Um, yeah, there's there's a journey that they all go on, mm. you know, and it may not be the class. I mean, you know, it's more of an art house film than a mainstream mm. film. I'd have to watch it again, but I think, you know, from 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 memory, Francis McDormand's character learns empathy and. Uh, and learns that you know Woody Harrelson isn't the enemy, but yeah. I'd I, I need to watch that again. Well, there's that learning again, though. That's it. That's the that's the storytelling. Yeah, I think that's at the heart. If they change, then it kind of proves the archetype. I think. So, so what has impressed you, uh, narrative structure wise, in TV, film, theatre, novels, in in the last year or so? Uh, Oh, well, yeah, great question. Um, I watched, the, for the first time, I watched a film called Satan's Tango. It's a Hungarian film, which is seven hours. <laughs> wow. It's seven hours in black and white, uh, all in the rain. Just literally rains throughout the whole thing, pretty much. And the opening shot is lovely. It's, lovely. it's a real test of your will. The opening shot is an eight-minute shot, tracking shot of cows walking through a deserted farmyard. <laughs> <laughs> you kind of watch again. What the hell? But it's kind of brilliant. It's hypnotically brilliant. I, mm -hmm. I love that. Yeah. And again, you can see. You step back. You can see the shape. But the thing that the the show at the moment that I think is the most sophisticated piece of writing on television is actually This Is Us, the NBC, uh, yeah, American show about the family cutting between past and present. Okay. Um, which I was I surprised myself by saying um, because it's very mainstream and it's not really spoken of in the way you know a, a, a fashionable Netflix show would be. But in terms of the way it manipulates time and structure, and in terms of just brilliant technique and the use of theme, it's it's the first three seasons indeed are absolutely peerless. I think they're just mind-bogglingly brilliant. Um, and of course, I would add to that, you know. And yeah, I'm, and everyone said this before me. I may destroy you. Um, yeah, the Mich Michaela Cole show I think is is breathtakingly brilliant as well. Okay, uh, I don't know either of these. I'll have to find them. You don't? Them oh in. God! And yeah, I'll put them in the show notes for. Yeah, yeah. They're, well, they're well. I mean, they're very uh, accessible, and um, uh, yeah, they're both on Amazon and Netflix or whatever. So, absolutely worth 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 watching. Um, you know, I try and watch everything, but but you know, sometimes it's hard. It's too much. Were you, were you as flabbergasted as everyone else seems to be by Fleabag? Oh yeah, no, there? yeah, Fleabag, yeah. I mean, it's very, it's a beautiful show. Yeah, and season two as well was was, was fabulous too. Um, yeah, she she's fantastic, you know. But it's yeah. a it's a lovely. I mean, she's got such a lovely voice. You know, mm. in terms of narratively, it's so brilliant. It's that that acidic vulnerability is yeah. is, is is just brilliant. And yeah, she's she's really special. It was so like IRL. It's like so in real life for so many people. I think that 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 hidden voice of hers, that yeah, breaking the fourth wall. Yeah, yeah, it's brilliant. No, it, and 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 also you know like she yeah she you know she's very smart because you know uh, a she took it from a stage monologue and adapted it. And opened it out brilliantly, yeah. but ended it exactly at the right time. You know, it's mm. like, it's, yeah, that's great. And yeah, I may destroy you is very similar in, in all kinds of ways. So if you haven't seen it, watch it. It's brilliant. Okay. Um, now earlier you skipped over your career, the BBC and Channel Four. I, I think you you were ahead of everything, right? So uh, <laughs> you undersold yeah, yourself. Not anymore. <laughs> 
but yeah. I just wanted I wanted to ask as, as a producer or exec producer is there a, a, a particular plot line that you managed to insert in anything that you are most proud of? <laughs> uh, well, uh, no, I mean, when I was, um, when I was, yeah, I started off on EastEnders, you know, the BBC soap and, um, and, and what I, you know, I started, my big break was, was getting the job of storyliner and I storylined probably in 1994, I storylined a whole year of EastEnders by myself. Uh, wow. And yeah. Um, so I literally sat in my bedroom for a year, um, um, chain smoking in the days when I smoked. And I mean, it was really bad for your health. And I put everything, my whole life I put in. I just, because I was just, a, you're just grabbing story. Yeah, my flatmate would come back and tell me what he'd done that night. And I just put it into the show. You know? <laughs> and, um, and so there's a, there's a lot of, you know, like, and also like, you know, there were, there were two characters I storylined. One was this extraordinary, brilliant rather harsh Lothario, who was incredibly successful, successful with women. And there was one character who was the complete opposite, the spotty oik, who, you know, couldn't get arrested. And, and I realised years later that, of course, the, the, the Lothario was the person I, I wanted to be, and, 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 and the terrible failure was the person I was. And I, that told me a lot about storytelling, how you're unconscious works its way into character so it's more on, a, on an unconscious level you play out your own neuroses through characters that's amazing to have that responsibility on your own though is that is that unusual or in america that well, wouldn't it was, happen the writer's room or well in those days i mean tv was so different then uh and it was an accident i mean yeah i didn't mean to do it but but somebody left and then the, the producer said to me look can you do the next month and that I did it and she said can you do the next month and it just sort of carried on from there and in a way it was it was it was I mean it was brilliant I loved doing it and it was at that point where those days you know, the show was being watched by 16 million people so it was so exciting you know yeah. knowing that literally you'd get on a bus and you'd hear people talking about what you'd done the day before wow. any everyone was talking about it in those days so 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 that that was lovely and very exciting so no i it was uh, you know was it a responsibility well there were a load of writers around me to to tell me i was rubbish and make it better so there was a safety net you know but but i you know i i i i think in some bizarre way it was the job i had always been born to do and and in some ways it was the most important job i've ever done okay well just just give us a a, a little treat what what was one of the the big uh plot moments of that that year that you were doing that oh god i'm trying to um there were loads of affairs obviously loads of love triangles uh the big story there were two two big stories one was um i mean again you'd never get away with it i don't think nowadays it's like david and carol uh the two characters who came back to the Albert square around the same time entirely separately and 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 David um, fell in love with uh, Carol's daughter Bianca, and then of course, just as they're starting to get together, Carol comes along and says, "She's your daughter," <laughs> uh, and and you play out the aftermath of that, which was quite an uncomfortable story at times, but it was actually fascinating, and the actors were brilliant, and so, so, so that actually worked worked really well. The one I'll probably go to my grave doing is, um, and I don't know how much it means to all the people listening, was 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 uh, not that dissimilar um, with with the characters Cat and Zoe, and uh, you're not my mother, yes I am, which is um, when when um, the daughter, the sister discovers that. The person she thinks her sister is actually her mother so it was a riff on that but if you live in the uk in that time you'll know it it's it's very famous in the uk i mean that that's but that's straight from greek tragedy surely yeah i mean that, that this is it they're all completely from greek tragedy and you know endless variations of it and also you know i mean the star wars thrown in there as well obviously <laughs> like, uh, <laughs> yeah but you know it's really the best soap stories are Greek tragedy, although, you know, a lot of Greek tragedies were far more violent and disturbing. Hmm. But I love, you know, there's that simplicity about Greek tragedy. You know, I, you know one of the first story I really read as a teenager and fell in love with was the, um, uh, was Antigone. Okay. And there, there's such a beautiful story, and that moral dilemma at the heart of it. And, yeah, those are the stories I love. The Antigone story 
is just brilliant. And the argument about should you bury the corpse is, is brilliant. Uh, now just just to finish, just a, a last question. Um, the 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 what you're talking about and what you're talking about in the book is it, it's so ingrained in our DNA, mm. right? And but it's not taught anymore. And I'm just wondering if there's a future or how do you, how would you see the future of the teaching of storytelling? Because surely and th there must be a, a change in education coming up because it's it's so like you know in the victorian era almost the, kind of <laughs> the, the the schooling that we have and storytelling personal finance household budgeting it must change at some point how would you like to see storytelling being taught would it be going from greek and moving through to current examples or what, what would you see it as it's, it's a very good question i mean i think and schools you know uh I mean, they you know, they do touch on it. Yeah, there's the yeah the story mountain. I think is a favourite uh, one that they teach in primary schools. Uh, um, so so yeah, that's fine. I mean, in a way, because storytelling is really an instinctive phenomenon. I'm not sure how much at that level you need to teach it. You just need to get loads of practice telling stories, and the more stories you tell, the better you'll be. You know, but it is a big bugbear of mine that. You know, I mean, it's getting better now. It's a lot better than it used to be. But the antipathy towards studying narrative structure in any shape or form in the industry for so many years was really striking and deeply disturbing and deeply stupid. Uh, and even now, you know, although it is better because a lot of film schools do 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 it, um, there, the, you know, there's still a, there's still antipathy of you know, but there's also nonsense. There's lots of nonsense written about storytelling and script writing. I mean, I subscribe to every storytelling blog, and most of the time I'm banging my head against it, like, this is just garbage. Now, even if you read Christopher Vogler, which is fascinating in all kinds of ways, you look at his examples in the back where he tries to apply the writer's journey, and they're completely insane. They don't make any, they're just wrong. Right? They're just all mad, yet that book, took over the world so so i what worried me and would in fact spurred me on in a way was you know it really worried me that we were working in a profession that was earning billions of dollars every year and cost things and should we not be studying it more closely to understand how it works hmm. and i think you know the thing missing is a coherent uh language Everyone talks a different language when they talk about a story like, you know, a crisis point to me is not a crisis point to anybody else. A midpoint to me means something completely different. So there's no coherence. I mean, it's slightly better in America. And in America, there's a much greater acceptance of, of three act structure. Whereas in, you know, where I grew up in the BBC where Robert McKee was the enemy, you know, like he was Satan. Uh, and, you know, Alan Plater, the great British dramatist Alan Plato, proudest moment of his entire career, was punching Sid Field in the face. You know, they were like, they, they, they just, I mean, but they wrote perfect structure. You know, it, it was so surreal. I remember talking to Alan Plato about it once. I mean, he's long dead now, but he was one of the seminal writers in the early days of British television. And, and in his later years, he was writing Midsummer Murders, which was a, uh -huh. a big thing. He was in his 80s then, I think, and he was still brilliant. And I said to him, because he loathes structure, he said, it's all rubbish, John, you just write. Uh, and, um, uh, you, you know, I said to him, so how do you write Midsummer Murders? And he said, oh, he said, it's really interesting. He said, because, yeah, the, 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 the murder is always just before the first advertising break. You know, and then just before the last advertising break, you know, all hope is lost. And I go, that's fucking structure. <laughs> Excuse my language. That's structure. <laughs> like, yeah. it's, you know, and, and so, and, and, and we all we all do it it's in everything you know it's like the more you look and then you, you have to be wary of confirmation bias but you know if you're any doubt yeah. structure just read shakespeare because it's just there yeah what was the question uh, actually it was it was about schooling but i oh what, yeah i just what about um you said something really interesting before we started about you you are learning right now because you are reading uh books to your very young son and you're learning from the children oh books. yeah yeah, it's such a brilliant instruction because, you know, obviously I can't sit there and read Antigone while he's around. You know, it's not going to work. You know, so, so he forced me to watch Octonauts and, um, you know, uh, Shaun the Sheep. 
you know, yeah. both of which are fantastic. I mean, Shaun the Sheep is genius, I think. Uh, every screenwriter should work on Shaun the Sheep, I think, that visual storytelling skill. But, you know, what, what, what becomes so clear is that the level of identification with the protagonist and the level of desire to defeat the antagonist and the emotional hit that comes from achieving that. But literally, my son spends all day pretending to be the central character in the drama he's watched that morning. And I, we all do that. We just suppress it as we get older. It's still there. But of course, if that's what you're looking for in a story is emotion. You, you are the protagonist. It's just so transparent in children. It's joyous to, to watch. You know, I mean, I remember it from when I, you know, I saw You Only Live Twice when I was 13 years old in Swiss Cottage Odeon. And literally for the whole week, I was swaggering down the road isn't I? in the most obnoxious way possible, I suspect, because I was in my head, <laughs> Sean Connery. Uh, it's the same thing. But as you get older, you go, oh, yeah, that was fun. So you kind of repress it as, as you get older, but it's still there. If you think of the last show you watched, you know, at some level, you want to be that central character. Of course you do. Yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm not sure. I'm not sure I agree with you about how many British men suppress the desire to be James Bond. Yeah. I think it's quite prevalent in the adult. Yeah, it's probably yeah, well, yeah, probably, probably so. But it, it, in my circles, it's frowned upon. But... <laughs> anyway, it's all about learning. I'm glad you're still learning. Everyone should be still learning. So, um, thank you, John, for your time. Absolutely, incredibly interesting speaking to you. Thank you so much. Let's do it. No, absolute pleasure. Thank you, Brett.